you know, when we had the broadcast, or the, the three broadcast networks back not so many years ago, everybody said, well, cable will be wonderful competition for this. This will guarantee localism and diversity. Uh, but lo and behold, now 90% of the major cable uh, uh, outfits are, are owned by the same people that, that own the broadcast networks. So then, more recently, we hear, well, don't worry, because we have the internet. And it's so open, and it's so dynamic, and so liberating and free. We went, uh, my staff and I, looked at the top 20 uh, news sites on the internet, and guess who owns them? It's the, it's the very same uh, people. And I really am worried about this, uh, this question of access, and, and you're so right with regard to the uh, uh, decision on, on cable modem and the tentative uh, decision on, on wireline. These are, are really uh, dangerous decisions, and, uh, uh, and we need to... Uh, I guess what we really need to do is delay for a while at the commission and make sure they don't do any more harm until hopefully a better day arrives. Okay, so now we begin the period for public testimony. Those of you who were here for the first half know the drill, but just in case you weren't, I'll review the rules quickly. We'll begin with a pre-registered testimony. Uh, each person has two minutes, and there is a timekeeper, and following uh, Joanne Bowman's excellent example, I don't have a legislative voice, but I do have a professorial voice, which I will use to say politely, thank you, when your time is up. And uh, I'll be calling names intermittently to come to the two microphones that are set here in the beginning, in the front. So we'll begin with Bruce Fife, Carlton Oaks, Craig Fondrain, and Janice Thompson. If you could come to the two microphones, please. Yes, Bruce, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Bruce Fife. I'm president of Local 99 American Federation of Musicians. While I'm here as a spokesman for our members and musicians in general, I'm also here as a private citizen concerned and offended by the changes that are taking place in the media. Consolidation is creating a dangerous situation where the historically vital role of media to work in concert with the citizenry as a watchdog for our democracy is being emasculated. Instead, media conglomerates and government seem to be in collusion, working to lull citizens into apathy as they chase profits, whatever the cost. The forces that have brought us together today are a known quantity. We have lived with the effects of round one of deregulation and media consolidation. I hope that with the decision today that musical creativity, diversity, and the livelihood of musicians, as well as a healthy and, vi and viable democracy, will survive the next round. <clears throat> Let me speak to the music. There was a time when a local band could get airplay on a local station. We were proud to hear a song from our band, favorite band played back in rotation on that radio, and we cheered them on as they moved to the next level and claimed them as our own when we saw them with a bullet on the billboard charts. That is the way artists have and should develop, the cream rising to the top. Today, Clear Channel chooses whom we hear. Ironic, because according to their CEO, they are, quote, not in the business of providing well-researched music, unquote. Due to their market share and vertical integration, there is no interest in local programming or airplay for local artists. Paid considerations rather than the merits of recording and artistry influence programming decisions. I'm sure you're aware of the inquiries by Senator McCain and Feingold into issues of payola. Clear Channel can leverage their radio stations against indie concert promoters, coerce artists to perform at Clear Channel venues, and generally threaten musicians with no airplay because of the monopolistic power they possess. Many musicians are so intimidated by Clear Channel that they can't afford to speak out. I have to be their voice here today. They won't come down. Now Clear Channel is starting to market concert instant CDs. They are not a record company, but their plan to sell these CDs threaten every musician's recording royalties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Carlton Oaks. I'm the Executive Director for Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center. We're a nonprofit multicultural arts organization whose mission is the commitment to creating an environment in which people of every ethnic and cultural background can come together as artists and audiences to explore, preserve, and celebrate their diversity. 
There are two issues I wish to address, funding for training and equipment, and an increase in coverage for nonprofit organizations in all media. IFCC is finalizing a $171,000 project grant made by the Multnomah Cable Corporation, our authority, installing a state-of-the-art video system in our theater. With these tools, we can broadcast our performances at a later date on our public cable channel, impacting the community beyond our physical boundaries. Next month, we will be iNet connected, making us an origination point. While this has been very exciting for IFCC, we are challenged with no funding available to train staff or community members maximizing the potential in our facility. Through in-kind support, Portland Community Media has provided personnel to record performances at IFCC. As we ramp up our programs, PCM may not be available for all performances. Additionally, as technology increases, we request funding resources made available to keep our capabilities current. As media corporations are buying radio, television, and newspaper companies creating single voices of representation, it becomes increasingly challenging for small organizations to have effective coverage. Corporations by, de by design are profit motivated, which promotes popular arts. Leaving behind artists and organizations like us who deliver quality products to the public addressing many community and societal issues. Just as small businesses is the engine of economic development, as told by politicians, artists and organizations in the same scale need to be recognized equally. Media giants and government have a responsibility and duty to ensure that small arts organizations and independent artists have effective exposure in the media. Thank you. Let me take a moment and call Jason Reynolds and Margaret Butler to the microphones. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Janice Thompson. I uh, head up a group here in Portland called the Money and Politics Research Action Project. And uh, what I want to touch on relates to political advertising. As a battleground state here in Oregon, we see a lot of ads on the broadcast TV. Um, and that's part of a, a national trend over the last 20 years. Um, political ad spending has gone up, adjusted for inflation, five times. From January of 2002 to the end of, to, to that, to the last general election, $9 million was earned by Portland TV stations on political ads. So on one hand, advertising revenues in this arena is going up, while as other testifiers have talked about, you know, the level of news coverage and other public affairs programming to kind of tell people in a little less, uh, in more impartial ways about what's happening in politics is declining. Um, this is particularly troubling because um, paid advertising is, is typically the largest expense of a campaign, particularly for federal candidates. So giving, giving candidates some ex access to the airwaves could help reduce the cost of campaigning. Now all this is particularly important also because studies document that the closer to the elections they get, um, the cost of political ads uh, increase higher than the rate of you know, any other cost. So for example, nationwide, I think the, it's a 2002 study was like the cost of political ads went up to about 53%, whereas um, other advertisements went up to just 15%. In Portland, there are two TV stations that had ad rates that increased 62% between the beginning and the end of the campaign. So three things. One is, all this is, relates to broken um, lowest unit charge uh, regulations. They need to be fixed. That's a congressional thing, but at that point, obviously, the FCC needs to be really diligent. And then um, the public interest obligations that have been talked about before really becoming um, meaningful again, stopping kind of the how they've been increasingly defined as, you know, um, meeting the needs of corporate. Um, Corporate kind of corporations create more commerce and jobs, and shifting to you know general uh, public interest obligations, and really having the um, uh, license renewal process really become more of a, less of a rubber stamp and a genuine discussion with the community. Thanks a lot for being here. Let me call Mary Beth Henry and the Mercer Island High School group to the mic as well. 
Yes, I'm sorry. Mary Beth Henry and the Mercer Island High School group. Go ahead, please. My name's Margaret Butler, and I'm the director of Portland Jobs with Justice. We're a workers' rights coalition of 75 unions and community groups. Workers' rights and democracy are deeply intertwined. You can't have a free society unless workers have the freedom to organize and bargain collectively without interference from their employers. As the consolidation of media ownership has increased at an ever faster pace, workers and their communities have been badly served, both in terms of content and in terms of conditions for workers in the media industry. In the 50s and 60s, every major media outlet had a labor reporter who covered workers and unions. That's long gone. In Portland over the years, our main newspaper and one TV station worked hard to get rid of their own unions. The continuing anti-union, anti-worker bias impacts the way that news gets reported here in our community. As a community organization involved in virtually every local labor struggle, it's extremely difficult to get coverage of important worker issues. One national study showed that worker issues were the subject of only 2% of national TV news. It's worse locally. In terms of what it means for media workers in the workplace, Comcast is the most egregious recent example. Three weeks ago in Washington, D.C., we held the first public hearing of the Jobs with Justice National Workers' Rights Board. The National Workers' Rights Board is a group of 54 Congress people, celebrities, clergy, and national community leaders who care about workers' rights and who are willing to use their moral authority to shine a public light on these important struggles for a democratic voice at work. The report from that first hearing on collective bargaining rights will be issued next week, but I have an advanced copy of it here for you. It's called, This is Comcast, Silencing Our Voice at Work. It documents the systematic abuse of workers and communities engaged in by Comcast. For me as a fifth generation Oregonian, I guess my ancestors did read the sign on the Oregon Trail. Um, it is outrageous that our community provides a monopoly franchise to a company that systematically destroys workplace freedoms, violating internationally agreed upon human rights criteria. The FCC can't do anything about that, but letting media get bigger just adds to the problem. No media conglomerate should have as much power over workers, communities, and the content of our press as is currently allowed. Consolidation of media ownership is bad for working people and our communities. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for coming to Portland. My name is Mary Beth Henry. I believe that local voices make wise choices. I am here today as a board member of the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, NATOA, an organization that represents the telecommunications interests of local governments across the country. We support local authority to develop public, educational, and governmental access channels and community programming. Our members provide diversity in programming at the local level. We also support diversity in media and telecommunications ownership and content. Democracy is strengthened with the diversity of voices. NATOA supports the orderly transition to a truly competitive communications marketplace. With the truly competitive marketplace, we will have a variety of voices. Finally, as trustees of our taxpayers, NATOA believes that local government should ensure that all private profit-making communications providers using public right-of-way pay reasonable compensation for such use. It's the last point I want to emphasize this evening. We're big technology users here in Portland. And we know that most of the companies that provide these services need to use public property at some point to deliver the services. We believe companies should pay for that use. Unfortunately, some in Washington, D.C. don't agree. With a stroke of the pen, in March of 2002, the FCC exempted cable companies from paying franchise fees on cable modem service. Franchise fees are used to fund vital local services like police, 
parks, and fire for our citizens. To date, our region has lost out on over $3 million in cable modem franchise fees that could have been providing services. We embrace all that technology has to offer, but it's important that these companies have public interest obligations that benefit our community. In Portland, Modem subscribership is growing by leaps and bounds. By chipping away at our local authority, the FCC is endangering local government's ability to fund vital services. Please don't preempt us. We believe that local voices make wise choices. Thank you. Could Mohammed Haq, if I pronounce that correctly, Rob Brading, and Rick Seifert come to the mic, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, I have to call out JJ, because she stole my best trick. Uh, the last time that I was uh, before the commissioners uh, was in Seattle, and I was the one who cried. So I can, I can feel you. I can really feel you. Um, but today, uh, I should introduce myself and, and throw out a pedigree. Uh, my name is Karen Toring, and I am the executive director for 911 Media Arts Center. And our mission is to uh, provide access and promote participation in the media arts. And by doing so, we provide ideas and resources that are necessary to empower and educate people through that media. But um, the reason I'm here is because I have like all of these notes that were uh, scripted by somebody else, not by me. And so I will quote, Mom, thank them for coming. Thank you, Commissioner Copps, Commissioner Adelstein, for coming. Um, I do have a couple of issues that I need to speak out before I introduce these amazing young people that are standing behind me. Um, as a citizen, uh, since I can no longer testify as a mother from the South Side, uh, as a citizen, um, I am very concerned that frequency and bandwidth be set aside in the public interest, echoing uh, the other comments that were made today. Um, but I, I guess I have to uh, uh, take uh, the idea that, um, that a formula cannot be created to uh, contribute to the capital and operating resources of nonprofit organizations that would use that public set aside is a bad idea. I think we should hit them with both guns. I think they should provide, broadcasters should provide public interest resources that were taken away over time, and they should pay. We should hit them with both barrels. Um, I'm also here to say that, you know, it's really time to change the balance of power. You know, for the last couple of decades, the private interest has taken the lead in the way policy is written at the FCC. And I don't think it's unreasonable now for the public interest to take the lead in the way uh, policy and legislation is uh, done there inside the Beltway. So now my introduction, <clears throat> and I should probably uh, uh, read from their press release that they wrote on the way here. <laughs> uh, yesterday, they'll, they'll release it tomorrow, students from different Seattle high schools traveled to Portland, Oregon to testify before the FCC on behalf of KMIH-FM, also known as X-104. So we live in Washington, and this is kind of a state-to-state -state issue, so we parked very close so we can leave soon. Uh, X-104 is a student-run high school radio station broadcasting from the Mercer Island High School in Mercer Island. Uh, an Oregon broadcaster has petitioned the FCC to transfer the license for one of their FM stations uh, in the, is it the Dallies? The Dallies? the Dallas, or we don't live here. <laughs> and I heard that joke differently. I heard the pile of uh, fool's gold was pointing to Washington State, but I beg to differ. An Oregon broadcaster has petitioned the FCC to transfer the license of their FM station from the Dallas, Oregon, to Covington in South King County, Washington. Because these two stations share the same frequency, the more powerful Oregon commercial station will be granted the right to use the frequency uh, if this move were to occur. And we do think that there is an administrative resolution that will allow KMIH, X104, a, a, a non-commercial, educational, Class D licensed station to continue to exist. And I'd like to uh, let these folks speak and tell why they think so. Oh, this is kind of high. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Hannah. I live in Seattle, of course, and I'm 16. Um, I don't go to Mercer Island High School, but I listen to their station. Um, I'm the type of person who can't sit through commercials. I go crazy. It's just so bad. Um, and it seems that all I ever hear on the radio station is commercials. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that a non-commercial radio station is not only a breath of fresh air, but a necessity to radio and all forms of communication. KMIH in Mercer Island is not only non-commercial, it is student-run and uh, it is a high school radio station, one of the few in the entire country. For these reasons and many more, I believe that rather than replacing 104.5 KMIH FM with another commercial radio station, we should pre preserve KMIH and continue to push for more non-commercial stations. Thanks. Um, my name is Nick, and I live in Seattle, uh, too, and I'm, I'm an aspiring DJ, and one thing that really helps me find the beats or something that I need is listening to radio stations, and um, X104 uh, has, like, the, the biggest mix of, like, the sounds that I want, um, and it's, like, in my, commercial or not in my area, and uh, not only does it play, like, a good mix of music, it's, uh, it's student-run, so, like, you get a learning experience on how a radio station works. And so the kids at Mercer Island have, like, bigger career choices when they uh, get older. Thanks. My name is Krishana, and I go to Garfield High School. I am the president at the Seattle Young People's Project, which is a youth-led organization, meaning that for every one youth to, on the board, for every one adult on the board, there is two youth. One of the projects that we have is the Martin Luther King Day Hip Hop Show, which brings in about 350 youth every year. This is important because it exposes the youth to music that they wouldn't normally hear on the radio. It is also a way that local artists can give back to their community. X104 supports the community by playing the music that the local artists make. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Rob Brading. I'm the executive director of Multnomah Community Television, which is the public education and government access provider in the East Metro area. We are that area's only electronic media source. Like communities like Salem and Olympia are underserved. We have nothing other than Multnomah Community Television. Portland's commercial media outlets may claim they serve us, but they really can't. It's not reasonable to expect them to serve the more than 30 communities that surround the Portland metro area in the same way we can. But if you see a network truck in our area, you can pretty much guess that something bad has happened. There was an accident or there's been some terrible crime. If you see a radio van, they're probably doing a promotion. They're not doing anything that's truly local. What happens in our towns, I know it comes as a shock to Portlanders, but what happens in our town's mayoral races is more important to my neighbors than whether Vera Katz was elected as mayor or whether it's Tom Potter or Jim Francisconi. I am sorry to report that to you all, but that's the truth. Our council and legislative, local legislative races will be lucky to rate a mention on the evening of November 2nd, and there will be no coverage of those candidates or their issues or the, the issues that affect my town of all of 10,000 of us as the campaign progresses. Again, it's not reasonable to expect that of the local affiliates. We provide that coverage. We're the only electronic forum for our local candidates. An LPM life license would be great. MCTV is the product of a local commitment backed by local regulation. Cable systems provide a model dedicated, protected public green space, funding to make use of that space, and local control for including and nurturing a genuine diversity of voices. This model needs to be expanded if we're going to see and hear the diverse low voices of our local communities. A really quick thank you to you. One of our favorite governors, Tom McCall, said, heroes are not statues framed against a red sky. They are people who say, this is my community and it is my responsibility to make it a better place. You two have done that. Thank you very much.
My name is Rick Seifert. I'm a founding board member of the Northwest Media Literacy Center. The goal of our organization and many other media literacy groups around the country is to empower people to critically assess media and learn how they influence as individuals, families, communities, and a society. We and those who work with us worry that television, far from serving the public interest, is doing great harm. Most of us are parents con concerned about harm to our children, about the vast body of evidence that excessive, indiscriminate television viewing can be harmful. Our clients complain that they and their children often are ignorant of the harm until it's too late. Exactly what kind of harm are we talking about? You are well aware of the hundreds of studies linking television with violence, poor school performance, stud stunted development, eating disorders, low self-esteem. Within the last year alone, studies have connected excessive TV viewing with rampant obesity and attention deficit order. Pediatricians in this city, often at the urging of their colleague, Dr. Robert Mendelson, supplement medical histories with media histories. Those histories often indicate a simple, promising, preventive measure, the selective use of the off button on television sets. Societal problems also are shaped by television. Consider TV's connection to excessive consumer debt, overconsumption and envi environmental destruction, a corrupted, money-driven political process, and unwarranted anxiety. It's the kind of anxiety that's created in part by TV's If It Bleeds, It Leads news values. We believe it is entirely appropriate in the public interest for television to help us right this harm. We agree with what FCC Commissioner Nicholas Johnson said many years ago, television is a great teacher. The question is, what is it teaching? It certainly isn't teaching media literacy. Why should it? The FCC created minimally regulated broadcast marketplace for the last 20 years. In this marketplace, broadcasters have learned that doing harm is great for profits. Broadcasters believe that critical audiences will cut into those profits, even though by other industry standards, their profits are already grotesquely large. In contrast, we believe that informed critical audiences will encourage the industry to reform itself once again and once again take pride in its work. Such audiences will make quality profitable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have Jean Carpenter, Joe Uris, Ray Larson, and Carl Reynolds to the mic, please? Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Mohammed Haq. I'm an engineer by profession, so I'm not really comfortable in this situation. I'm better be in my lab. The reason I'm here, as my name implies, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim, and I live in America. I'm a nationalized U.S. citizen, so I'm an American Muslim. So I have a, a perspective about media post-9-11 America. And what I see in the media, not all the media, some of the media, is that the constant demonizing and belittling people, that they're, they're not like the mainstream people. So, and that, I think, creates an environment that where, when there are incidents that happens that hits up the geopolitical confrontation, we, the minorities here, uh, feel very weak and, and very uh, kind of don't know where to go because this is my home. I don't know any place to go. So I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. So I know that the First Amendment, everybody can say anything they like, but my only request to the commissioner is that during the crisis, can the FCC do something, on, especially on those outlets where they have talk shows that kind of constantly, this barrage of negativity that comes out, can they be asked to do some public uh, service messages like saying, be tolerant, like in the middle of the program, can something come out and say, be tolerant, uh, maintain law and order, don't go out, uh, look for your neighbor who looks Middle Eastern, things like that. So that will be my only request to you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. I'm George Trinkus. I would like to address an issue I have not heard addressed tonight. It's called BPL, Broadband Over Power Lines. I'm a publisher by profession, but I'm also a shortwave listener, a CBer. This is a 40 channel hand unit uh, and a former ham. I understand that uh, the utilities are pushing for a 70 megahertz byte out of the spectrum in which to run broadband, uh, internet service, et cetera, over utility power lines. 
Is this not true? I've been hearing chatter to this effect. It's on late night radio, it's on the bands. Uh, unprecedented, I've never heard of such a bite. The, the broadband over power lines will propagate radio interference that will virtually wipe out short wave and much of VHF. We're saying bye bye to this CB. We're saying bye bye to ham radio. We're saying bye bye to short wave listening. Radio Havana, bye bye. And uh, VHF above that, emergency services, 47 megacycle cordless phones. Uh, I understand the ARRL has done studies on interference, and they have the numbers for you in decibels. Uh, across your desks has certainly come their petitions. Uh, I think the Wi-Fi individual here spokes, uh, might have something to say as well. I'd love to hear what you have to say about BPL. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Hey, commissioners. My name is Ray Larson. I'm currently the engineer at Portland Community Media, and I've been the engineer at a couple of other facilities in this region. Freedom of speech isn't just speech. It's the freedom to hear different points of view, unfiltered by the commercial world. I know the power of television. 25 years as a producer, 14 as an employee of three different peg access facilities has also taught me the value of regulating the cable industry. Meaningful speech assumes that the system will deliver your message. Access was never intended to be broadcast quality. Nationwide, few access channels were ever provided an infrastructure to even meet the minimum FCC technical requirements. When major signal problems were discovered, it would take days or weeks to get them repaired. All the while, the industry would blame access. Access was never the problem. Our signals weren't perfect, but the problems were system related and the industry would never own up to it. We installed vertical interval test equipment on our channels and the problems were obvious. The signal quality was not acceptable. Transmission and head-end technologies completely unacceptable to the broadcast industry and to the cable operators themselves were uniformly deployed for public access. The required signal-to-noise ratios were rarely within the FCC specifications. This problem is not unique to Portland or the Northwest. All the access engineers across the country that I've spoken with have had similar stories. We've been fortunate in Portland with our regulatory process. Comcast has addressed most of these issues of the past decades. But this doesn't obviate the nature of the damage to public speech. The goods were damaged by the delivery system. We know we're a very small fish in an ocean of sharks. Protecting free speech is never a very popular cause, but regulating the rights of, the, of these people to protect the little guy is the entire reason we have government. Thank you. Can I call Tony Cole, Carol Cushman, Paul Milius, and Ellen King to the microphones, please? Go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm Jason Reynolds with the Oregon Consumer League. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we help consumers that, with problems that arise from fraud in the marketplace, uh, people that have been swindled by car dealers, banks, credit card companies, and the like. It's almost impossible to get any of this news on television stations. We've been told specifically not to offer any of the local stations any information about cars or banks. The advertising department comes down on them, and the reporters have been threatened that they'll be fired if they do these stories. News is now a profit center. To generate profits, TV news is almost exclusively the police blotter. It is crime and catastrophe catastrophe stories and nothing else. You can click from one to the other. It's the same attempted rape, the same burglaries, the same fires, the same murders, the same school shootings, and nothing about what's happening in the community. The stations are not locally owned and controlled. They're run by out-of-state media conglomerates whose sole interest is profit. Most radio stations have dropped their news in public service departments altogether, and several of the TV stations have done it as well. Public programming, interview programs that were on radio and television stations half a dozen years ago have all disappeared. They don't make money. It's cheaper to run very conservative talk shows on a company's 50 or 100 radio stations than it is to book guests locally that talk about what's happening in the community. 
The control of news that reaches Oregonians is in fewer and fewer hands. Very few of the people that control it live or work in Oregon. This is a direct result of the FCC allowing media companies to own more and more stations. To say that the web is a news alternative overlooks, overlooks two facts. One, poor people often don't have the web access. And secondly, that two large corporations control most of the web, web access and it will only get worse in the future. The free market practices the promise of deregulation that more voices would be heard is not true. Deregulation has reduced diversity in newscasts. This in turn is destroying the people's ability to make informed decisions about voting and their role in democracy. Unless we reverse this trend, we will continue to see voter turnout decline. Thank you. The, Thank you. Very one much. more sentence. The public controls the airways and we'd like it if they were returned to us. Thank you. I'm Carol Cushman, and I have lived in Oregon since 1970, and I'd like to comment on some changes that I've seen in what I, I would say newscasts over those last 30 years. I've been a dinnertime news junkie since I was a child when the radio ran while dinner was being prepared. I continue to listen to news at 5 and Dan Rather at 5.30 most weekdays. The 5 o'clock news now seems repetitive. The same story footage plays on successive nights with small variation and on location spots are often meaningless. Uh, as an example, before I came this evening, I did catch at least the first item on the local news and the promo of the first item was exactly the footage that has played for the last two days. Uh, town Hall, back to some good things. Uh, Town Hall, a weekly Sunday night stalwart on KTU-TV, probably at the time Joella Whirlin was working there, invited leaders and ordinary citizens from the area to discuss a topic of interest. As elections drew near, you could expect to see the interested parties for each ballot measure have an evening of lively discussion. I understand that Town Hall is still part of KATU's programming, although it is so infrequent, I do not recall the last issue I heard discussed there. Based on KATU's website, there were five town hall shows in the fall of 2002, only two shows in all of 2003, and just one so far in 2004. Again, KATU has the only active reporter assigned to the state legislative sessions. In the past, I depended on the evening news to at least give me the basics of what topics were being addressed in Salem. Those stories are not being pursued at this point. City hall activities were regularly covered as were items from Portland schools. It seems that seldom are such items even mentioned now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Paul Milius. I'm a member of the City Club of Portland, and I say that proudly. And I would submit to you, media moguls, if you're not members, you should join. Uh, for example, tomorrow we're going to have Brandon Mayfield, the unfortunate man who was arrested and held for two weeks by the FBI for nothing, uh, speak to us about his experience. Um, my concern is that democracy will not survive if the people do not have a complete picture of the impact and results of government policy and actions. My concern is that the impact of media controlled in a few corporate hands uh, on the availability of information the government does not want us to see. In darker moments, I say, I tell myself it's a Nazification of American politics and society, but that's maybe just my own political paranoia. Uh, we already have a highly sanitized uh, public broadcast media. You can hear the seven dirty words George Carlin jokes about on every middle school or high school playground, uh, public or private, uh, but not on television. Uh, the, it seems that the only lesson the government learned in Vietnam was not to let the media photograph the bodies and the wounded. This has been brought to a new level of obfuscation in this Iraq war. There, there are video teams all over filming for all kinds of networks and stations all over the world. And yet, watching American broadcast TV, you would never know Americans and Iraqis are dying uh, gruesome deaths. 
Uh, the Europeans, Asians, Latin Americans all see this footage, uh, but we can't. How do we as citizens and you as our representatives assure the presentation of balanced information if broadcast and print policy are set by a few execs who openly support the ruling party and present only the government propaganda line, only what the government wants us to see? Where is our free press? <clears throat> we should not have to buy a cable service or a computer and pay an AS ISP to get a full and accurate picture of what the government is doing in our name. Thank Democracy you. will not survive if the people do not have a complete picture of the impact and results of government policy and actions. Thank you. My name is Ellen King, and I have been a public access producer for about 13 years. And it opened up a whole new world to me and hopefully to some of the viewers uh, that watched some of my productions. I have fibromyalgia and it was a disease unknown to many women. It's a very painful disease. And I did a program on it with Dr. Robert Bennett from OHSU. I did a series that told all about that disease. As a result of that, many women contacted me, they wrote letters, they called the station saying, thank you for telling me that I'm not really crazy, that this really exists. That's one way public access can be something good for a community, to help, help the community and to help people as a whole. When I was small, I remember hearing about Radio Free Europe, and I wondered, Radio Free Europe, I didn't understand because I was too little. But lately, the past, especially the past maybe decade, I have begun to understand the importance of Radio Free Europe. Enron, for example, is, a, is an example of what happened with private companies monopolizing. And I am concerned about what belongs to the public becoming privatized so that people are oppressed. They can't afford water, they can't watch the news, they don't know the truth. Public access, newspapers that are independent, and KBU are icons of what our nation is all about. And I stand here saying that monopolizing all our media is dangerous to our freedom because once the people are gagged, no one will hear unless there becomes a radio-free America. Thank you. Let me call Jason Barber, Nancy Newell, Sam Churchill, and Steve Witte to the mics. Go ahead, please. Uh, my name is Rose Griego, and I am the chairperson of Metro Murals, a nonprofit public arts group here in Portland, Oregon. While it may seem that the issue of public art is out of place here at a meeting intended to address the FCC and its role in the future of the media, there is a disturbing situation going on right now here in Portland that does address the monopolistic nature of corporate media, which is at the heart of the debate that we are now entering about who owns America's media and why the changes being cont contemplated have such far-reaching implications be beyond merely who owns what radio or television station. Portland is a city that prides itself in being a model of urban progressiveness. Part of this forward-thinking changes were the ones made to the city sign code in order to temper the proliferation of billboards that had sprouted in the city center. For nearly 25 years, the city had struggled with the question of how to regulate the visual pollution, so when the time came, the city chose not to renew with Clear Channel, who, through buy-ups of local media groups, now owned 90% of the outdoor media market, a contract which had allowed for certain concessions to the sign code exclusive to them. What followed was a standoff between the city of Portland and Clear Channel, and a moratorium was placed on all billboards, painted wall advertisements, and, much to the surprise of the local arts communities, murals. Clear Channel had filed a lawsuit using murals as a loophole in their case against the city. In 1998, the judge ruled in favor of Clear Channel, declaring that the city sign code had an illegally regulated expression based on content by allowing for the creation of murals and not for the building of billboards, with Clear Channel stating this distinction impinged on their free speech rights. Shortly after the judge ruled against the city, Clear Channel again went back to court, filing a notice of appeals, and is, 
it, and is continuing to this day in fighting for an even larger settlement in the millions, hoping that the city will cave into their demands and regrant them access to the cityscape so they may continue in their monopoly as the largest outdoor signage company in Portland. Because of the lawsuit and subsequent ruling, community-based mural art has come to a virtual standstill due to the threat of continued litigation that Clear Channel has been holding over the citizens of Portland for six long years. With the unprecedented attention being paid to the media situation today and the roles that megalithic corporations like Clear Channel play in the debate, it is imperative that the public be made fully aware of the threat that is looming over every aspect of art in the public realm. It has become increasingly obvious that corporations like Clear Channel, through its monopolistic machinations and political cronyism, are intent on controlling our area not only everything we see through television and billboards, everything we hear through radio and live music venues, everything we read through newspapers and print media, but that they are also wanting to tell us what to think through the co-opting of public spaces and by declaring their billboards and advertisements equivalent to public art. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Jason Barber. For the past two years, I've been a radio broadcasting student at Mount Hood Community College. Uh, I actually myself didn't understand the whole Clear Channel thing until I saw a billboard for Fisher Broadcasting's KATU on a Clear Channel billboard. I no longer watch TV news. I can't stand their lack of news. And I don't subscribe to cable because I don't feel the programming content of the channels that are offered by the programmers is worth the monthly charge by the cable company. Really, I use the medium, the mediums I use are local radio stations, local newspapers, and my $8 a month dial-up internet connection. Maybe I want to hear more about meetings like this while I listen to 40 minutes of continuous music, you know, an example. Uh, and actually, for example, KUFO mentioned on the air the FCC is in town today, but they didn't say anything about this meeting. If not for websites like sbe124.org and pdxradio.com, I probably wouldn't even have known about this meeting. The community needs to be more aware that a company might own the equipment that puts a station on the air, but the public owns the airwaves. Maybe even a meeting like this every time the license renewal comes up is, is needed for, for that. Uh, I'm actually mostly concerned with the so-called nonprofits like Educational Media Foundation and Calvary Chapel, which use the legal loopholes of their nonprofit status to broadcast the same special interest programming over hundreds of stations nationwide, then clog up the radio dial with needless translator stations, which somehow have less restrictions on placement and, and higher effective radiated power possible than the current licensed LPFM in the United States. And speaking of that, the LPFM restrictions do need to be eased. I think any independent person that demonstrates they have the technical expertise to operate a station should be able to apply, not just the nonprofit organizations. That just adds an extra layer of bureaucracy to the mess. So maybe if anybody was able to apply for it, maybe people like Mike Oaks wouldn't be fined for illegal, illegally operating a transmitter. And then also the technical specifications, in my opinion, should either be the same thing as the translators or the translators need to be parred down so it's the same as the LPFMs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to call B.J. Seymour, Jim Long, Jim Robison, and Jonathan Snap Cook. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak. My name is Sam Churchill. Uh, I've been a resident of Portland for about 30 years, and uh, I'm a blogger. Um, and although I didn't plan on it, uh, advertising from my blog uh, supports me. Uh, and, and I'm not the only one. And it cost me virtually nothing to set up this blog. Uh, the post pictures, audio, video, it's, it's called Daily Wireless. It covers uh, wireless news. Um, uh, but I'm not the only one. I'm inspired by uh, Christopher Frankos, who I just met for the first time. I, I don't know if he's still here. I'm sure he is. I thought I'd see him here. Uh, he always reports more news than Channel 2, 6, 8, 10, 12, 49 combined. I mean, this guy covers the local government beat better than anybody else and uh and isn't isn't that what it's all about i mean uh i think uh, a blogging allows people to pursue pursue their bliss to write to think to communicate and um and don park who uh is the co-founder of daily wireless with me we're charter members of personal telco 
which has about 100 free Wi-Fi nodes around town and uh, provides free broadband, like the air, like radio, and like television. So I think free Wi-Fi works for cities, too. Uh, city cloud RFPs were announced by Los Angeles today. They are going to cover the city of Los Angeles with broadband wireless, and so has New York. They announced theirs earlier this week. Atlanta, Baltimore, Baton Rouge, Boston, Bella, Bellevue, Charleston, one Cleveland, Orlando, Pittsburgh, Louisville, you name it. There's a lot of cities that are doing Wi-Fi or, or uh, broadband wireless. And why? Because it's cost effective. It's, 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 it's cheaper to say, uh, well, we've got these uh, parking machines electronic parking machines in downtown Portland, they each cost 20 bucks a month for the cellular link. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. My name is B.J. Seymour. I am a member of the City Club, and um, in deference to Ms. Nelson, for three years in the early 80s, I hosted a poetry radio show, so I'm here to tell you that K. Boo does well with the arts. Um, I speak primarily as a citizen interested in media representation of all aspects of public opinion. Specifically, I'm a psychotherapist working with gender minorities. The gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transsexual populations need to be assured of fair treatment nationwide and are too often ignored. When any minority group is denied a voice, all citizens are deprived of important information and fair representation. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jim Long. I'm from North Plains, Oregon. It's a rural community. I only get broadcast, te broadcast television. On Friday morning, May 7th, I was watching Donald Rumsfeld speak about why we're in the, you know, relations to the, before the Iraq and the 911 commission, what was happening there. I was listening very intently. Some protesters at the back of the room started shouting out some questions, and the ABC affiliate I was watching, that's where I get my best reception, they cut away. They cut away and cut off uh, the coverage of 911. And uh, I was very upset by that. I thought that was some censorship that just had no place. Uh, I'm here mostly, I'm, I'm supportive of community radio. I support community television, public radio, public television. I would like to see you gentlemen fight for 20% of the spectrum of digital television for public access, for community service. Let's just put a number, I'll put it at 20%. But I'm mostly here today to talk to you about local problem solving. Uh, we all grew up with uh, the telephone and I'm here to hold up the largest book in the state. It's the Portland uh, Yellow Pages book and uh, what's interesting is that after 20 years of having the Blue Pages in it, the Portland Yellow Pages book does not have Blue Pages in it anymore. There are very few government offices, schools, human services. Uh, the FCC isn't in here. Uh, I'm, I'm approaching this at the state level uh, with a rulemaking petition, but I want you to know, I walked in, I was working for the Carter administration, I walked into the FCC building, talked to Adrian Auger, who was head of complaints for the FCC. I outlined what I knew, the evidence I had about phone books. He said that was definitely the violations of state tariffs and federal charter statutes with the errors, omissions, and inadequacies and currently in phone books. Now this is important that it's also it's true in Seattle, Phoenix, Minnesota, all of U.S. Quest, Quest Service area, but it's also, avail it's also the same inadequacies are evident in the biggest cities around the country. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you for the time, and I applaud your efforts, and I'm going to go celebrate the court decision tonight. <laughs> Let me just quickly say we're going to take the testimony from the last two people who are standing at the mic, allow the commissioners to make their summation comments, and then we will return and get through the list of all those who wish to testify. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay, thanks. My name is Lise Brown, and I'm a stay-at-home mom. I can't afford cable TV rates, therefore I don't see cable public access. Could I just ask a question and perhaps get an answer? 
what can we do to get public access channels on the free broadcast TV and radio airwaves? I don't think I really have heard any suggestions about how, what can we all do? Do we need a grassroots effort, you know, like politics? And can anybody up there or anybody answer me that? Well, the FCC has the authority to, to mandate it. Uh, Congress could require the FCC to do it. So you need to contact the FCC in terms of the digital public interest requirements that we put on broadcasters. And I would also suggest if you feel that way that you could mention it to your members of Congress and confront them with the idea. And you have some very uh, thoughtful members, particularly Senator Ron Wyden, uh, who was on the Committee of Jurisdiction, and so was Senator Smith, uh, to let them know that Congress could mandate that as well, that there should be part of the airwaves that are given back to the people in exchange for all the benefits that accrue to broadcasters. All right, let's, let's all do it. Let's I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the chair of the Democratic Party in Multnomah County, and I welcome you to Multnomah County. But the uh, one point that I was going to make was just made, so I don't need to repeat that other than to say that I've been involved in a lot of community activities, and I have gotten onto cable access television a lot. It's been really the only way to get coverage of, of many local events. The problem that I've had with it is that I don't have cable. And so I never get to see myself on TV. And people offer to give me videotapes of it, but I don't have a VCR either, so I can't watch that. So that point was already made. I was going to also tell you, I wanted to also tell you about a recent incident a couple of years ago where I used to listen to a local radio host that was on a local ra locally owned radio station that was a commercial station because she was the only liberal talk show host in the in the city and I could not believe that in Portland there would only be one liberal talk show host and she was taken off the air by the station that that she was on and I asked the people there at the station why they said it was because of ratings they wanted to get someone with higher ratings and when I looked into the Arbitron ratings she actually had the highest ratings for her time slot she also had the highest ratings on that station so and after they took her off the air and replaced her with a conservative a nationally syndicated conservative show the ratings for the station dropped now recently, we have received in this market Air America Radio on KPLJ 620. And when that came to be, the ratings for that station quintupled. So there's definitely a market for that here. The problem is not the ratings. The problem is who owns the stations. And I do not believe that the market in Portland demands that Michael Savage be on the air instead of liberal talk shows. Right. Thank you. So I'd like to give the commissioners an opportunity to make some summation comments. And then, as we said, we can go until about 1030 and try to hear some more testimony. Well, just real briefly, because I, I know it's late, we want to hear from you, but there sure is a lot of wisdom here in Portland that we've heard tonight. Uh, you have the ability here to condense it into very short statements, too, and we're, we're pleased with how you've done that. You've done it with eloquence. I've heard a lot of passion, and I've gotten a lot of insight. And we need to take all of that back to Washington. What I heard is some good old common sense. You're tired of seeing the police blotter every night on the news, and you want the media to reflect what's really happening in your community. You know that you own the airwaves, and you want to take it back. That's what I heard. And today, you won a huge victory for everything that you stand for in the court. The court backed our efforts to back you. And now it's your turn again. You have to make sure that you seize this day, this historic day, this giant victory. We have to keep the pressure up. The pressure that brought us this far, the pressure that brought us to the incredible victory that we won today on June 24, 2004. We have to make this the beginning of yet another new giant effort to translate that court victory into new rules that serve you. Some of the ways you do that, you create real public interest standards on broadcasters in the digital age. 
You make sure that you win back low power FM licenses so that you can have your own community voice heard back. And you stop media consolidation in its tracks by killing these new rules and putting back real protections for you. So I want to thank all the great panelists, all the organizers and sponsors who put this together so well. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for sharing your insight and making this such a huge success and making us feel so welcome here in Portland. Well, let me just echo my colleague and my friend. This has been a, a wonderfully informative uh, evening. I hope it is well covered. I'm glad we have a, a camera or two here. I hope uh, tomorrow morning your friends and colleagues will have the benefit of reading about this in the newspaper or hearing about it on TV and radio. I well remember being in Phoenix, Arizona for a hearing about a year ago, and I got to talking with somebody in the audience. That's a pretty consolidated media environment, too. I said, how'd you find out about this meeting? He said, oh, I heard about it on the BBC. <laughs> so maybe the BBC will carry something about this hearing. I don't know. But uh, you folks are articulate, you're informed, you're impassioned. I get the message, just as Jonathan did, that you feel something is amiss, that much is lacking. We need to take this sense of urgency that I can palpably sense here and translate it into action in the very near term. Now, we need your help on a lot of things. We talked about the public interest uh, standards for digital television, and that's uh, important, and Jonathan and I are trying to push that now at the commission. I hope we can get something going. We've got the license renewal process. We need your participation in that. But there's one thing right now, as of June 24th, with this media consolidation, we have a real chance with the American people to put this on center stage. I don't think the press can ignore uh, what happened today. And if something else happens tomorrow with a meeting or next week or the week after that, we have to have events come, come, come to keep, the, uh, to keep the pressure on and to move us towards some sort of a decision on this, to keep the pressure on the commission, keep the pressure on the Congress. I'd ask each of you, when you get up tomorrow morning, you know, if you, if you really feel strongly about this, and I know everybody, I think, in this room does, call a relative, call a friend, talk to folks, write a letter, contact your decision makers, let them hear from you. This is a golden opportunity, and I, as I said before, I don't think it's going to come again. We've gotten this far. There's a lot of momentum on this issue. You've got Congress involved, the courts involved, the FCC in a position where it can't really ignore this now. So I think if we keep the pressure on, and no guarantee of, of success here, and, and the odds are still, still pretty steep, but be that as it may, this is, uh, this is our chance. And you all have been heroes uh, to get us as far as we have, have gotten here. Uh, you'll be heroes forever if we can actually bring this home for the American people and bring, uh, bring media democracy uh, uh, to this country, and God knows we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who's participated tonight. The commissioners have very graciously agreed to uh, stay around a while longer and listen to more of you from the list. We'll try our very best to get through as many of you who have already signed up as we can. So I'm going to continue with uh, calling some names now to the microphones. Barbie Scott, Diana Swan, Colm Rennan, and Chip Shields, please. Or not. <laughs> All right, I'll continue on down the list. Ron Miller, Richard Sessions, Charles Savi, and Lisa Brown. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Diana Swan, and I was going to talk about um, what the last two people talked about, but since um, I guess I'm wondering if it's possible to take our, our government agencies that are here to protect the people, such as the FCC, back from corporate interests, and if there's any way to keep people
people with strong corporate ties out of government agencies, especially the FCC, the other three commissioners, and if you have um, got anything in mind for that. <laughs> or if there's anything we can do. <laughs> did you want yes. well, to use the remaining there, Congress could, could put uh, conflict of interest rules in place. Currently, uh, people have to recuse themselves if they come from private industry into the FCC for up to one year. If they work for on a particular issue affecting the FCC, they have to recuse themselves potentially for longer. But any, say you work for, for Quest or something, you, you can't do on any issue that would affect Quest for a year after you get there. Uh, that may not be sufficient to protect the public interest. You could decide, but if Congress wants to, in its wisdom, it could extend those protections further and also extend the protections afterwards. The other problem is that people leave the FCC and try to cash in on their public service and go to work lobbying the FCC on behalf of some of the most powerful interests in the country. And uh, they're the ones who can afford to pay the most, and uh, that's not right either. And they're pre we're prevented for a year afterwards from lobbying the FCC, but maybe that should be five years or 10 years or never, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Hello, members of the, of the commission. I'm glad to see that the Michael Kopp and Jonathan Adelstein, I suppose you both here are here tonight. Appreciate your making the trip. Even some of the other members didn't make it. I am Mrs. Louise Weidlich, president of Mothers for Children, PO Box 19224, Portland, Oregon 97219. And I am a concerned citizen and an activist of sorts. And uh, one of my favorites is Abraham Lincoln. I have faith in the people. They will not consent to disunion. The danger is in their being misled. Let them know the truth and the country is safe. I can't work less. But I, it isn't that work never troubles me. Things look badly and I can't avoid anxiety. Personally, I care nothing about a reelection, but if our divisions defeat us, I fear for the country. I think there are several things that we need to be reminded of Abraham Lincoln. I would like to see some of the media on public radio and so forth to bring in some of his sayings that have come up in the past. And uh, I have, uh, it's important not to have too much media control in any one uh, area. Like, um, I'd like to read this if I have time. 10, 30 seconds, I can't read it. Um, the approach of danger, we expect the approach of danger, expect a transatlantic military giant to cross the ocean and crush us with a blow, never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasures of the earth and their military chest with the monopart for a commander could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track in the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is this approach of danger to be expected? I answered, if it ever reaches us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. Thank you, thank you if very much. If destruction be our lot, we must be ourselves because author and finisher as a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Thank I you, Ms. Weidlich. Thank you very much. You and let us know that our country is in grave danger and that we need to have media, and we need to have control of our money. And the, we put Goldstein or put some of these people back in there, head of the Federal Reserve, and yet we never question them, even the Thank Congress. you, ma'am. We need to move on to other people who wish to testify. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Teresa Burgess. I'm the Vice President and General Manager of KPTV and KPDX Television here in Portland, representing Fox and UPN Networks. Um, despite what Mr. Olson may have thought, there were actually three broadcasters um, here today. Um, but the reason he probably didn't know that was because the organizers of this event didn't see fit to invite local broadcasters to participate. So just like everyone else, I've been waiting for my turn at the mic. Um, I don't really want to replace Mary Lou Gunn's role as being the poster child for consolidation, um, but I do think it's important uh, to say 
that the company that I work for, which is actually not Fox, which a lot of people think is actually a company called Meredith Corporation. They own about a dozen television stations in, across the country serving local communities. Um, they, like many broadcast groups, do not favor uh, lowering the cap on ownership. Uh, many of us broadcasters uh, feel that it's important to have diversity of voices. Um, we invest a tremendous amount um, in terms of what our capital expenses are to provide five hours of local news a day. We provide public service to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars to nonprofit agencies without any obligation to do so. Um, we, for example, just spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on a piece of equipment called a leaderboard to provide better election coverage. Um, and I think what's missing is the reality of economics. Um, despite Commissioner Adelson's statements, we're still waiting for the windfall from the digital spectrum. As an industry, we've spent billions of dollars and have yet to see one penny of return on that investment. Um, so my main reason for being here is to say, if you have any thoughts or suggestions for us in terms of doing a better job in serving this community, don't wait until 2007 to tell us so. Write us, call us, send us an email, and tell us how we can do a better job of serving you. Thank you. Thank you, David Bean, Bert Press, Jazz Duberman, Pam Alley. Go ahead. Uh, my name is David Bean, and I'm very grateful for your long campaign on the benefit of citizens to help uh, be informed. I'm going to try and read this in time. Um, thank you for coming to Portland and offering. Uh, um, I'm grateful for your uh, persistent efforts on the issue of. Uh, of national import. Um, this is not a partisan issue. I am a registered Republican, and I would be grateful for you to share this with your Republican counterparts. Um, I, would, I wish to present why it is the duty of the FCC to reinstate the Fairness Doctrine and provide free airtime to support each election cycle as a condition for receiving a broadcast license. Just as it is the duty of a democratic republic to provide a free education so that the electorate is capable of voting wisely, in like manner it must provide a free information system for supplying data by which to make the electorate can make accurate decisions. Currently, the signal to noise ratio is terrible and consequently, the decisions are bad. In order for a democratic republic to successfully navigate the future, it must have an informed electorate. In order to have an informed electorate, democracy must have a free and func functioning press. The reason for this, aside from the, its establishment in the Constitution, is that in order to perceive the opportunities and threats that the future may hold, the electorate that selects the leadership of the country must be appraised of the facts in order to engage sound judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Pamela Lee. I'm just a citizen. Although, as an ordinary citizen, I am a member, owner, and sometimes volunteer at KBOO, which I am very grateful for. Um, thank you also for being here and hearing every one of us, even though we seem to be, we have very few themes, um, and we keep hammering those nails. <clears throat> um, I'm here because I'm alarmed at the erosion of both citizen responsibility and the democratic process in America. And I'd like to uh, just name a few of the Virtual media blackouts, co corporate media blackouts, just a few. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, um, the efforts of people here at home and abroad to stop any of these wars. Um, <clears throat> Greg Palace reporting of the Florida voter fraud. Any logical discussion of Palestine or Israel. Um, 
Pictures, not just of flag-draped coffins, but bloody, mangled, and burnt remains of brown-skinned children that we killed with our tax dollars. And finally, the, uh, the giving away of a, a national, major national security item here in Portland, which was uh, a few years ago, which was uh, dry dock number four. And this was a major national security item, which we bought and owned and was given away. I wish Mr. Our Mr. Michael Moore were here for that comment. <clears throat> um, democracy really must always remain a, uh, something of an experiment. Otherwise, for instance, only white property-owning males would have the vote today, but they don't. We've, we've worked at our experiment. Inherent in the word, of dem in the word democracy is the ideal of self-government by an engaged people. But, as we've noted here, if people are not literate in historical and current events, which is something achieved basically by good information and good debate, then there cannot be this, this engagement, but only disenfranchisement, and therefore poor decision making and apathy. I guess that's a little bit of repetition there. The vicious, whining, deliberate silences and lies by both omission and commission, which characterize mainstream American media, remind me of nothing so much as the apple bonkers and butterfly stompers of Yellow Submarine, which I hope, I think some people here are old enough to remember. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mike. Please call Paul Marish, Chuck Fall, Tom Civiletti, and Greg Ebert. Yes, sir, go ahead. My name is Bart Preece. I'm a technology writer from the Seattle area. I'd like to speak to an issue that has not been addressed so far tonight. You have an item on your docket whose technical title is Additional Spectrum for Unlicensed Devices Below 900 Megahertz. For 70 years, the foundation of broadcast policy in this country has been the granting of exclusive licenses to, to broadcast owner operators. And that fundamental policy is the root of most of the abuses and most of the problems been cited by the other speakers tonight. And this rulemaking procedure is an attempt to finally address that issue after 75 years of experimentation with the concept of those exclusive licenses. Uh, shared spectrum, unlicensed spectrum will not be a panacea and will not solve all the problems that we've been raised tonight, but they will take broadcast policy in a radical new direction. And I, as a technology uh, ex expert or practitioner, know the potential for the creating different kinds of alternative media out of that unlicensed spectrum. Uh, this measure will be radically opposed by the most powerful lobby in Washington, the broadcast lobby, and I implore the Commission and the members of this audience to keep track of this issue and take advantage of this opportunity. If you want to solve these problems, the short answer is unlicensed spectrum. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for coming to Portland. My name is Paul Maresh. I want to make a plea right off the bat that existing listener-supported nonprofit radio stations with a proven track record should be allowed a digital TV channel license gratis. Uh, the following are uh, representative of some people more than just myself, and that is that we wish to advocate that the FCC institute a policy and a formula whereby the percentage of revenue a broadcaster makes selling political ads is reflected in the number of public affairs broadcast hours that, broadca that broadcaster makes available gratis to candidates in the month preceding an election. We also plead to reestablish the requirement that broadcasters provide free PSAs, reinstitute the fairness doctrine, Recently, I and several hundred Oregon volunteers spent many months and countless hours working for a presidential candidate. Our candidate electrified crowds around the state, and all the while his campaign appearances were virtually ignored by the commercial broadcast media and, and the state's largest newspaper. He was covered by nonprofit community radio stations, smaller community newspapers, and community access television. As others have said here tonight, it is the public, and by extension, our democracy that loses when candidates who do not toe the corporate line are denied coverage. In a recent mayoral, Portland mayoral primary, one candidate spent $1 million. And although the field was large, there was no substantive air coverage of the race 
with the one positive exception of KBOO radio. So once again, please reestablish the fairness doctrine, reestablish free PSAs, and institute local public affair content res, uh, regulations. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, I hate microphones. <laughs> My name is Jazz Duberman. I was also inter recently on the board of the Northwest Media Literacy Center. And first, I want to thank you both very much for coming and thank all of the people, the local people who organized this. This is a, an incredible opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I'm also going to talk about democracy again, so I'll understand if your eyes glaze over a little bit. <laughs> Uh, in October 2001, at a forum on politics and the press, state represent, state, Oregon State Representative Mark Haas, a former TV news reporter, pointed out that a for-profit media corporation's first responsibility is to its stockholders. And he's right. There, as far as I know, there is no legal requirement or financial incentive for the media to actually serve the public interest. Democracy requires participation, voting, for instance. For meaningful voting or any kind of participation, members of a democracy need information. Thorough, complete, accurate, balanced, really balanced, not Fox balanced. As objective as possible, information. This is the question I posed three years ago to Representative Haas and to many people since, to which I have never gotten an answer. I'll pose it again tonight and maybe someday I'll get an answer. If media's primary responsibility is to its shareholders, whose responsibility is it to inform the members of a democracy? Whose responsibility is it? The government doesn't seem to think it's its responsibility. The media doesn't think it's its responsibility. So that, it seems to me, must be part of the definition of the public interest. Thank you very much. Let me call. Martin Morgenbesser, Doug Sweet, Patrick Lamb, and Bill Parrish. Go ahead, sir. I'm Tom Civiletti. For over a decade, I've co-hosted and co-produced TV Set, a public affairs program at Portland Community Media. We emphasize international and alternative sources of information in an attempt to widen the range and perspective in covering important issues. This has allowed me to compare the treatment of important issues by the US mainstream media with coverage by a variety of other resources. And to conclude, if one is a fan of plutocracy, control of society and government by wealthy interests, then the US media is doing a great job. Most large media outlets are owned by a small number of huge corporations which share many common interests in how our government and markets operate. Advertisers who share many of the same interests affect what is covered and how. What maximizes profit as opposed to what maximizes the public interest is increasingly the grail of media managers. Entertainment is dumbed down and permeated with cheap titillation. News is transmorphed into infotainment full of crime and disaster, celebrity gossip, and product hyping disguised as news. Important issues are either ignored totally or covered in unenlightening sound bites. Controversial subjects or viewpoints are shut out, leaving common misconception intact and powerful interests unchallenged. Government pronouncements on matters of international conflict and the military are accepted uncritically, allowing the manufacture of public support for horrendous wars that have no legitimate justification. Political campaigns are covered as sporting events, minimizing discussion of relevant issues. In fact, political coverage is truncated in hopes of maximizing paid political advertising. If, on the other hand, one supports democracy, and recognizes the importance of an informed citizenry in making democracy work, then many changes in our media are needed. I applaud today's decision by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in overturning the FCC's recent change in media ownership rules, but the status quo does not suffice. We need more diversity of media ownership, ownership that values the integrity of journalism as much as it does profit. We need a return to the fairness doctrine or other mechanisms that guarantee that divergent views are not shut out. We need free time for political candidates so the tyranny of the dollar does not dictate our government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will Seaman, Jim Pritchard, Carol Corrin, and Cedric Justice.
Go ahead, sir. Yes, commissioners, my name's Martin Morganbesser. I'm a licensed amateur radio operator. And as you know, amateur radio is more than a hobby. It's a service uh, which provides vital emergency health and welfare communications free of charge uh, to the community. Now, what a concept, using the public airwaves to provide a public service. Um, that service, as well as other public and emergency radio communication services, uh, including police, fire, aviation services, are threatened by the power line industry's implementation of broadband over power line, uh, a technology which seems to be fast-tracked by the FCC in spite of engineering studies submitted by the American Radio Relay League, a uh, study submitted by the National uh, Telecommunications Information Agency and FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, what's interesting is NTIA and FEMA, after su uh, stating their concerns and uh, about interference potential of BPL to emergency services, a month or two later uh, said, well, um, we didn't really mean that, and we'll, we'll help the FCC in promoting um, broadband over power line. And I wonder what was going on there that caused them to alter their statements, although they didn't provide any um, additional uh, uh, or, or alternate um, studies to support that. Um, you know, there probably aren't too many amateur radio operators in the audience tonight, uh, but, you know, think of a, oh, there is one other, at least one other. <laughs> okay, uh, think of us as the canary in the mine, <laughs> and that canary is going to be one of the first to go. Um, other vital communication services will be interfered with by BPL. I urge the FCC to fulfill its role of protecting our frequencies, protecting the spectrum, and not merely become um, the promoter of one particular technology when there are many other technologies that do very well in providing broadband service uh, competition. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Go ahead. Hi, good evening. My name is Patrick Lamb, and I want to thank all of the commissioners for coming. I know it's really, really late, and uh, you guys have families. Um, I am an independent recording artist and musician here in Portland, and I would hope that we would not let ourselves get into a position as a community of the fox looking over the hen house, which is kind of what it seems like has been happening. Um, we need to get away from the discussion of services, which, which are in fact incredible and technological marvels, and back to the, the principles by which the media conglomerates are set up and how they affect our community and nation. Uh, Clear Channel is an entity which owns most of the FMs that play our music on the airways, and Clear Ch Channel has mandated and banned promotion by independent label promoters to radio. Are, are you guys aware of that? I just, I'm, not, I'm just asking, are you guys aware? Okay. Um, while the reason given for this is, cl is clamping down on payola, which I agree with, um, you know, banning promotion by independence is unjust, unprincipled, and an abuse of power. I hope that commissioners, uh, I hope commissioners that you would be, a, this would be an indication to you of what abuse of power by large media giants will enforce in the future uh, without more guidelines. Independent artists are banned from promotion to radio unless they are assigned to a major label. At this moment, there are no rules and there need to be some. Please make some. If you give complete power to the few, it will, of course, corrupt completely. Let's, let's not do this without checks and balances and principles, rules. I feel what, like we are headed in the wrong direction. 20 song lists, 20 song song lists are played on the radio as dictated by consulting firms and corporate, uh, corporate entities and not artistic interests and radio DJs. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. My name is Will Seaman. and I uh, work with a local group called the Portland Peaceful Response Coalition and primarily what I have done over the last 20 years actually is volunteered as a media liaison for community organizations like Portland Peaceful Response. Um, I want to comment on um, uh, just the, the thrust this evening has been talk about uh, local control and diversity of ownership. 
And I think, of course, these are both very important principles to be working on, um, but it's very clear, at least in my experience, that they are certainly not sufficient. Um, you can have a diversity of ownership, and if it's 50 uh, Rupert Murdochs, that's not much help to us uh, any more than it would be to have one Rupert Murdoch. Yes, it might be a little bit better to have 50, um, but the interests that a Rupert Murdoch represents uh, um, are not the interests of the broader public, and that needs to be uh, that needs to be represented in our, in our media. I think that militates for uh, public media, for public broadcasting, and along those lines, it's very clear that public radio, uh, national public radio, and um, the television um, the correlate have failed, really failed completely, in my opinion, uh, from my perspective. Um, and we need only look to the fine work of fairness and accuracy in media in the surveys they've done to demonstrate that um, essentially public radio in this country, NPR and uh, television, have been corrupted by corporate uh, underwriting. Um, I want to also touch on the question of, um, uh, of local programming. The reason we need a national public uh, broadcasting uh, in this country, something, uh, yes, like the BBC, something that uh, has the controls that protect it from, uh, shield it from corporate interests, but also shield it from government interference, is that we do have global concerns and local programming very often is not able to or is unwilling to address these global concerns. So I want to make, emphasize the need to go beyond uh, local and also to go beyond diversity in terms of principles that guide shaping a media policy that truly serves the broad public in this country. Thank you. Let me just quickly, I'm, we're trying to figure out with a few minutes that we have left um, how many people we still have to fit in. Would you please raise your hand? I'm going to call the names on the list quickly and just let me know if you're here. Jonathan Irwin, Kathleen Chapman, Carol Rossio, N Noah Larson, Cynthia Anderson, George Trinkus, Brooke Jacobson. I'm trying to tell how many of you are here. Virginia McCray. Uh, uh, Oh boy, sorry, you, you know who you are. Uh, Leandra Rouse, Bill Ellis, Al Van Hartman, Austin Reed, Chris Reed, Ron Buell, and Mark Allen. Can I see your hands? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try to go quickly. We're gonna tr try to cut down testimony to a minute, 30 seconds, just to, in an effort to get everybody in. Go. <laughs> uh, my name is Cedric Justice. I'm a musician um, in a Cure tribute band called the Exploding Boys, and I'm also a student at Portland State in the Masters of International Management program. Um, I wanted to give you guys just a personal idea of how FCC regulation affects uh, people. Um, mine is sort of a story of defeat though. Um, I, as a musician, I've given up listening to music on the radio. It's the same thing over and over. I've also given up on trying to be on the radio. Um, I've nearly given up on the whole Ticketmaster idea because the ticket prices are so expensive. They've mentioned Clear Channel, and I just paid that fee today, the 350 or whatever. Um, as a student, um, I, I see my schoolmates uh, share books. Um, this results in the artist or the author being underpaid. I've also given up on TV news. I've given up on cable because of the costs. Um, there is no competition, unlike what Kurt said. Three pro Three providers is an oligopoly, it is not competition. Um, this threatens my access to mainstream media. This disadvantages me as a musician, as a student, and an informed citizen voter. Um, so art is not profitable, it's a human right, and it's being taken away from us. Um, I'd also like to just ask where the media is. Um, they weren't in, invited, I guess, but uh, being stuck at the airport is chickening out. That is uh, like the dog ate my homework, and if I were in Regina's class, I'm sure she wouldn't expect me to say that. <laughs> Thank you. If I called your name a moment ago, could you just go ahead and step up to a mic, and we'll try to get everybody in if we can. Please go ahead, ma'am. I'm Carol Corrin. I uh, am here tonight as a person who serves as a panelist for Department of Commerce Technology Opportunity Program, and I'm also an advisor to Secretary Ann Veneman of the USDA on e-government and technology, like a lot of others, wonderful Portlanders who have come forth to let you know their thoughts about the media. I am concerned about the need for diversity of ownership and for limited free access to broadcast airtime for all political candidates. But I stayed the extra mile tonight 
to talk to you about last mile coverage. I think it important to speak about an issue that's very dear to my heart as a founder of American Stories, an organization that's dedicated to providing communication venues for rural Americans. Right now, many rural communities are struggling to bring last mile canopy coverage to their communities, and I urge the FCC to consider allocating or surcharging licensees to support ubiquitous national access to wireless networks throughout the United States. I also want to speak about the other last mile along American highways where currently low frequency public airwaves have been reserved for transportation safety uses. And those low, wave air, those low frequency airwaves that someone else spoke about are of critical importance to people in rural America. For them to have access to that venue as a vehicle to provide broadcast opportunities where broadcast opportunities are not otherwise available is critical. I've spent a week in Washington trying to get access to meet with people such as you and I very much appreciate the opportunity to do so tonight, to make the case to look at other alternative uses for those broadcast airwaves that are available for public purposes, the community access organizations in rural communities, the land that we forget Thank you. need. Thank you. Uh, hello. I'd like to try to practice communicating here. Uh, I want to search for a way for everyone to get their needs met. Uh, you know, this is going to involve more than our communicative bodies, but also the extensions of them, uh, our media. <laughs> Nowadays, our, uh, television has replaced elders who, who once embodied the wisdom necessary to make good use of our freedom and power. Uh, we humans think in metaphors and learn by stories. And uh, the elders' stories were picked, uh, they were generated for their qualities. Now elaborate systems of quantities are, are the gatekeepers for the, for the stories. And this makes it easier for us to individually and collectively to misrecognize what our needs are and how to pursue them. Uh, and, well, awareness of the future of power, of the future of technology, animates my contribution uh, to the future of, of media here. And I feel like my words are falling into a black hole. Hi, my name is Virginia McRae Riviaga, and I'm not a president of this or that. I represent the very least of these. I'm a teacher. I teach ESL, or English, to the children of immigrants who add so much to the fabric of our nation financially and culturally. I ask my students to dream big, that they can graduate from high school, maybe be the first in their family to do so, and to go to college that they can be doctors and lawyers, politicians, and yes, even anchors of the evening news. Some of my students look, to me, look at me like I'm crazy to suggest such things. They must have role models on the airwaves, and even more, they must be able to see issues that are important to them and their families. Now, issues like immigration, migrant workers' rights, and cultural events beyond Cinco de Mayo are not covered. My students and their parents want to be informed citizens. The media in this information age are not providing what it takes to be an informed citizen. Hispanos son un parte muy importante del futuro del este país. Hispanics are a very important part of the future of this country. I'm a teacher, but I can't do it alone. It takes a village to raise a child. We've all heard this so many times. And thanks to you and your guidance on the FCC can provide the access to the local and greater global village for students everywhere. Thank you so much for your contribution. Hi, my name is Austin Reed. I'm 16 years old, and I've been producing and hosting a live weekly teen newscast on MCTV, giving teen-related stories and interviewing local citizens, making a difference. I've now been doing the show for three years. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, now what I'm going to 
talk to you about tonight is what public access has done for me over the past three years and others. Um, public access TV has helped me learn community television, whether it be run a camera, edit stories, run switcher, sound and direct shows. It has helped me become a better on-air talent, which is what I wanted to do, what I want to pursue in my life, learning how to become a news anchor. It has uh, let me have a great relationship with my parents as they have been greatly involved in my show as they come out to the studio every week at MC TV and um, to help me run the show and um, also my dad and I uh, we bought an edit station we edit uh, other shows that on the side of Rose City News uh, public access has let me get at least 30 students throughout the three years involved with my show as they learn to anchor produce and write stories for newscasts instead of getting in trouble with police uh, and they come out, instead they come out and learn how, how to produce a newscast every week. Going into this coming summer, Rose City News has four shows total. Rose City News at 7, Rose City News at 4 Sundays, Sports Rap Live, and Rose City Hype, a teen talk show. I have designed a website, which I update every day. My show has a great following, and even JobDango.com, a major uh, local job website in Portland, has teamed up with us. He's uh, Ralph King, the owner, saw the show and loved what we were doing and decided to team up with us. And I know... There are a lot of, uh, there, well, there are some bad shows on public access. However, Thank there you. are, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Leandra Rouse, and um, I knew if I waited long enough, I'd get a private meeting with the FCC commissioners. <laughs> so um, I'm here, I figure I have to, I don't have an organization to represent, but I do have two of my professors in the room, so I better at least show them that <laughs> what they're doing has, uh, we've caught on to some of it. Um, I'm here, I want to talk about, represent the youth at least, and say that we're a generation that is saturated in media and um, really it's the lifeline in our connection to this culture. And um, we need to have the opportunity to, to make our own decisions and make our own political ideas rather than have things packaged and sent to us. So I'm here to promote public broadcasting. Um, I think that the, we need more government subsidized stations. Um, I think that this would allow for more, make it less partisan and make it more neutral. Um, let's see, fast. <laughs> less advertisements, obviously. More publicity for your FCC um, policies so that it becomes a public concern rather than a radical liberal idea. And lastly, I'd like the FCC to stop dining with Rupert Murdoch. That doesn't look good. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Ron Buell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Copson and Mr. Edelstein, for coming to Portland and for your courtesy and your leadership. Uh, I'm a businessman and uh, looked at the possibility of trying to do a different kind of uh, local television news, and I want to share some of my research with you. Um, there's a, this is the 24th largest uh, television market in the United States. and About $100 million of local advertising goes to our, I'm sorry, of, of advertising uh, from both national spot uh, advertising and local spot advertising. It's about 50-50 on these uh, half a dozen local stations we have. And uh, about a hundred million dollars. And about uh, a third to half, depending on the station, goes back to the owners as profits each year. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, there are no locally owned television stations in Portland. Uh, a, somewhere between 45 and 55 per, percent of those dollars are spent on the, the local news programs. Uh, and uh, that means that they are chasing ratings so that their time is worth more for advertising. As a result of that, uh, what we get is 58% of the time, and this is based on tapes of uh, not just programs in Portland, but across the country, 58% of the time is uh, weather sports and advertising. 
Of the remaining 42%, over 50% is mayhem. That's uh, dis disasters around the world and crime and fires and automobile accidents and the like. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Chris Reed, and I would also like to thank you for being here, not only being here, but staying so late, because I'm sure you must be tired. I know I am. I'm here as an advocate for public access television. As my son Austin just told you a few minutes ago, he's been involved in public access for going on three years now. Uh, he does a tremendous amount of uh, television shows out there, much more than I do. However, uh, public access for me has been a very interesting and enlightening experience. One of the things that I've done was a special for Mothers Against Drunk Driving, a group which I volunteer for. Uh, members of my group, the Multnomah Hood River County chapter, allowed me to actually view or interview them and photograph them as they placed flowers on the graves of their lost children who were killed by drunks. Uh, in addition to that, Austin and I have also collaborated on things like uh, the Multnomah County Board of Elections who allowed us to come over there and took us through the entire electoral process showing everybody how their ballot actually does count and how it gets counted. John Kaufman was good enough to do that for us, who was also interviewed on Austin's show. Real quickly, I want to mention his website, which he forgot to tell you, which is rcn-tv.com. I do a public access show every, every month, which is live. It's called Are You Fed Up? You people really need to watch this, you people who are here right now. It's every second Thursday at 10 o'clock. Finally, I just want to say one thing about kids. We see a lot of public uh, uh, things on, t you know, the uh, television about where your kids are. Well, folks, let me tell you something. Since I've been involved in public access with my son, I know where my son is. I don't have to worry about him. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Carol Rossio. I appreciate your staying to the bitter end. And I'm a professional vocalist, a jazz and pop singer, and I just wanted to quickly reiterate what some of the other musicians have said about this radio airplay um, blockade, if you will. Uh, I have a very good local following here in Portland. I have two CDs out, they're self-produced. I've done all the big major venues. And uh, like uh, Sharon Janassi, earlier talked about she they produce documentaries um, that are uh, wonderful uh, rare documentaries that are not obliged always to conform to the talking heads format of PBS thank you thanks yeah my name's Al von Hartman and uh, I'm just every man, and I would uh, like to say that uh, a, a lot of what people have been talking tonight are, is very important, but I think you're always going to be um, treading water until you get, uh, till, till you can reach every man, and every man uh, lives in a fast food, junk food uh, world and doesn't uh, get his news from uh, the small public access uh, channels and so forth. Uh, they get it from the fast food giants, the McDonald's of media. And uh, the, my suggestion to you, and uh, my plea to you also, uh, would be to, if we can, if we can uh, regulate smut in the, in the airways, and if we can uh, regulate pollution in just about everything, uh, including our food, uh, why can't we regulate uh, the content of what people say, particularly politicians, uh, with regards to truth, and that require like say in uh, political advertising that no statements be made that aren't the truth, that aren't verifiable. Thank and you. thank you. I'm Joyce Folingstead, citizen of Portland, Oregon. Thank you for this public hearing and it's better late than never. We need to de decrease the consolidation 
of our airwaves, which has resulted in decreasing diversity of information, reducing information to 30 second sound bites, destroying dialogue between various viewpoints, and gives very little connection between the airwaves and the local community. Disney, Clear Channel, and the like choose what we hear. They're not interested in the local individual, only in profit. Indeed, we hear horror stories of automated radio stations that do not have any way to interrupt the canned music, news, and ads to let local persons know about emergencies that include fire, highway detours, local weather that is unusual, and other hazardous events, leading to larger cat catastrophes than need be. We cannot have a free society without all of our diverse voices being heard. As a psychologist, I see a growing anxiety and apathy among our citizens as they are told untruths like the economy is improving while they lose their jobs and told our housing starts are up while middle-aged women in our city in professional clothes begin their life on the street with a fresh new shopping cart and while I bring food to my clients to keep them alive knowing they, uh, that I will never be paid. Our media is primarily interested in scaring a citizenry into bland, unthinking, fearful swallowing of what our administration and richest corporations want them to believe. In, indeed, you would think right now our news would be telling us there's only two countries left on Earth, the US and Iraq. Someone needs to speak for the disenfranchised people, their discouragement when they see no long, when they no longer, excuse me, their discouragement when they no longer can vote because they've lost their addresses is only deepened when they no longer see or hear anyone who looks or speaks like them Thank on you very much. radio or TV. The airwaves is the commons of all Americans. It is wrong that most radio and TV airwaves are given to for-profit stations. It's time that the airwaves are returned to the people. I know we've said it many times tonight, but I'd like to once more thank Commissioners Copps and Adelstein for staying with us so late this evening and listening. And to all of you. Great last statement. Well, thank all of you for staying to the bitter end here, and that was a great last statement, too, that time to take the airwaves back for all of you. So thanks for being here and sticking with us to the end and we're happy to stick with you and to hear every last word because it was all so useful and so filled with wisdom and insight that we don't get enough of inside the Beltway. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.